From the heartland of the United States and one of the leading children's medical centers in the world, welcome to the Children's Mercy Kansas City Pediatric Bioethics Webinar Series. We invite international leaders to discuss critical and controversial issues in bioethics. Now, from the Bioethics Conference Center on the Adele Hall campus, here's Dr. John Lantos. Uh, we're going to take the summer off webinarly speaking, but we will be back in the fall with uh, a whole range of topics. The stories in PEDS bioethics are all over the place. Artificial placentas, genomics, shared decision making, burnout and stress in the PICU. We're going to talk about all of those at some point next year. For those of you who are in Kansas City or local, uh, May 18th and 19th, our students from this year's certificate program will be coming back for their graduation symposium. They'll be presenting papers on their final projects all day, uh, Thursday afternoon and all day Friday. Uh, that's at Children's Mercy in the community room. If you're interested in that, send an email to Vanessa or look at our website. We'll send you more information. We're still taking applications for um, 2018's certificate program. We have a nurse leadership program, and we also have scholarships for students from low and mid middle income countries. So if you're interested in learning more about those, go to our website. Just type in Children's Mercy Bioethics Center in any of your search engines, and you'll find out more about that. For today's webinar, we are live tweeting during the webinar at hashtag IndiaPeds bioethics. For those of you on the webinar, uh, here's how it works. If you haven't been here before, the speaker will speak for about 30, 35 minutes. Then we'll take your questions and comments. You can type those in to the little chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Today's speaker, we are thrilled to um, have uh, Dr. Somashekar Nimbalkar joining us from Karamasov. Karamsad. Exactly. India. Um, he is professor and head of pediatrics at the Pramukswami Medical College there and heads the facilities of the neonatal unit as well as central research services. His CV and his LinkedIn page are daunting. He's done work in public health, work with low birth weight babies, early nutrition, children's immunization, pediatric emergencies, pedi uh, kangaroo care, therapeutic hypothermia, postpartum depression, and many other topics. And today, he is gonna talk to us about some issues in end of life decisions and also about an innovative project they're developing called Code Krishna. Welcome to Kansas City. Uh, uh, thank you, John. Uh, and thanks to the uh, Pediatric Biotic Center at uh, Kansas. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, following the meeting in November last year, the first Pediatric Biotics meeting in India. And we hope to do one next year too. Uh, I will want to discuss two things and I'll try and get all the slides within half an hour hopefully. And uh, so we're going to talk about ethics and end of life decisions in India and something called as Code Krishna that we have developed at our institute in, in Karamsad. Uh, Karamsad, by the way, is the birthplace of the first home minister of India who is known as Sardar Vallabhai Patel. So our university is actually Sardar Patel University. This, So this doesn't work. Should work. No. Not advancing. Not advancing. Okay. Uh, so while this gets done, uh, we are going to talk, talk about something called as uh, discharge against medical advice and uh, and that how it relates to ethics and end of life decisions uh, for India. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know where India is, this is in this in Southeast Asia, and from where I come would be in this place. This is Gujarat, and then where our institute is in this Anand district, which is central Gujarat. And so this is the place, the city, and this is our hospital. It's named as Sri Krishna Hospital. Uh, so context, context is everything in, in ethics, and uh, hence it's important to know the area. So what else uh, is contextual? Uh, almost uh, 75 to 80% of all the healthcare that is delivered to children, anyone adults, is by private sector. Uh, so the government services don't extend to these many people, though they're available. Uh, most of the expenditure is out of pocket. In fact, in a study that we did a few years back, only 3% of children had some kind of insurance. So everything that is paid for is out of pocket. Uh, and often farmers, uh, people slip into poverty 
uh, due to loss of la land and livestock. Uh, public services sectors are often understaffed, over under-resourced, overburdened, and provide poor quality of care. And this is one of the re main reasons why people don't seek uh, these sector services, although they are available within the same vicinity. Uh, every parent prefers a better quality of care, especially for their children, uh, as compared to their own selves. Uh, for ethical decisions in, in clinical practice, there are no ethical committees available in most institutions. Uh, most institutions have had a binding to do research committees, and so they, many would have them, but clinical ethics committees are almost non-existent. One of the things is because uh, when patients run out of money, they often refer to the public sector by the, by the private sector. So the question that we wanted to discuss is Dama uh, end of life decision. So what happens in Dama? Dama is discharge against medical advice when the patients or the relatives would take the child away from the hospital and stop the treatment midway before the child gets better or and before the treatment is completed. And there are various reasons why that happens. Uh, it's quite common. Uh, like in our NIC, we have almost 20, 20, 25 percent being taken Dama, but there are hardly any studies on it. So if you look at for data for Dama decisions, why people take Dama, in children there are only about three studies so far, and that, that's a very minimal. And one of them is ours. One is from Lucknow, which is from a pediatric center. Uh, one is from uh, West Bengal. It's more mainly related to the emergency department, so includes adults too. And the one which I'm going to talk about a little is the one which we did. Uh, it's a qualitative study that we did in, in INICU. Uh, coming to the Lucknow study, uh, it, it was mainly conducted by the pediatric residents, I think as a part of his thesis or, or, or his dissertation. Uh, it was an administered questionnaire to the patients who were leaving the hospital against medical advice. Uh, it's, it's a very large hospital, big university hospital, has around 4,000 plus admissions in, in the one year that they studied it. Uh, and they looked at children from above one of year of age to 12 years of age about 5% or 6% of admissions went Dama. And most of them had Dama or went against medical advice in the first two days of life. And most patients were admitted on an average if across all the patients that went Dama, about 5% uh, of them, uh, about for three, three and a half days. Uh, most of the time, the father made the decision of taking the baby Dama. And remember, these are neonatal uh, pediatric patients. Uh, most respondents said that they took the patient Dama because they did not they it was taken in favor of the family it is not explained as to why but i would reason out that uh, family was getting affected because of hospitalization of the kid and hence the child was taken dama uh, most would have taken it home it, it, this is in lucknow and this is central india uh, they would decide from the time they decide the quick dama what happens is then somebody tries to counsel them the doctors would counsel them saying that uh, we should not take this people dama you should complete the treatment uh, but generally that fails and usually within six hours from the time the person expresses that he wants to go dama the patient would be out of the hospital uh, one of the reasons what they said was financial reason second was a low probability of survival or perceived terminal illness so this is something which i would want everyone to remember low probability of survival or perceived terminal illness or what is known often as futility uh, other reasons were also dissatisfaction with hospital care and family commitments now these are just four about four reasons also why they went dama financial low probability of survival uh, futility uh, dissatisfaction in hospital care and family commitments uh, and they had uh, they did statistics which showed that if the child was a female it was more likely to be taken dama and if the child that was taken Dama was, was a male, then he went probably to another hospital. And so that's how, how, how it went. What they said, that there should be financial, uh, rural families with low parental education were more likely to avail Dama, especially for a female patient. And trying in the first two days of hospital admission to try and prevent Dama by counseling or talking to the parents would help. And also financial support needs to be provided. Uh, this is what this study said and and it is important to remember this because we we addressed almost all this in our study though we did not do it intentionally uh, we did a study which is slightly different from that study we looked at it it was a more of a qualitative study uh, we didn't look at large numbers uh, it was the neonatal population as compared to the pediatric population in the Lucknow study uh, neonates as we all know if they get discharged they're more likely to die than a pediatric patient who, who, who might get discharged uh, was conducted months after discharge. So it was intentionally done months after discharge, something like six months to one year after discharge, because uh, we also have the professor asking the patient why he went Dhamma, but often the parents in a hurry wanting to get out would tell them it's for debility, et cetera, and they would not give the real reason. So we, if you go down six months down the line, we might we thought that we might get the real reasons. And it was interviewed by a person who was not treating the child. 
and again it was similarly that we had more males admitted than females though discharge wise there, there was no difference so we eliminated the financial burden every patient that wanted to go down was counseled there was financial counseling done a uh, full support of that uh, afforded by the hospital uh, so anyone who want, was going dama uh, would actually not have had to pay all fees or would would not have to face any burden if the person stayed in the hospital so that financial thing was taken out financial thing for hospital manage, hospital treatment uh, so this was an actual effort by the social workers and not the residents so the social workers and the hospital staff uh, did this and if it if the still patient still went then a full return discharge was given uh, to the patient so almost a quarter went away of of the 454 babies that were admitted over a year period 25% went dama so it's it's a large number of babies uh, we chose about 50 of these babies within a 50 kilometers to look at uh, to interview and in depth interviews were conducted of all these 50 babies and of the uh, quarter that went away one third of them went away on the first day so not even 40 days most of them went away on the first day itself so we this were the threads this is not a, this is a percentage wise uh, it's a very small study 50 numbers so we should not look at it in terms of quantity to terms but in terms of uh, what what are the reasons again non affordability trumps everything uh, then there would be no improvement then there would be poor prognosis uh, and then there is something called as bad behavior by of peer or personal which is actually not bad behavior but probably trying to hide the remaining reasons uh, within this uh, putting it in a chart it tells you uh, that almost about 30% is because of these reasons uh, we we'll just look at what people said about it uh, they said that uh, i i paid 35000 rupees and then they still spoiled the case so what is the point in being there if there is no improvement so again kind of futility uh, this baby was probably a smaller baby was going to improve and we couldn't couldn't discharge a smaller baby out of the nicu and the baby had to gain weight but the parents were not ready to stay in the hospital till the weight gain was adequate for survival after discharge because that would involve a lot of time another patient said there was no reason of money these are patients words translated from gujarati we are ready to pay any charges for the baby uh, but his brain is not working that means if he had survived its effect would have been life long doctors tried their best and this is another one doctors told that she drank amniotic fluid and her brain was not working so we took discharge so again the fact that you know the baby will survive if the baby's brain is not going to work then there's no point of staying in the hospital so it's very not even uh, futility of care but futility what's the point of having a baby who's not going to talk or walk uh, again this is something which is very unique to india people insist that you give guarantee on the on the life of the baby that if i ex- if I, this is very simple if i spend 2 to 5 lakhs of money your product has to be good it shouldn't die And this, and this is not very uncommon. It's quite common. One of the common reasons why people would take away the baby, saying that if you don't guarantee survival, I am not going to spend money. There is money coming out of their pocket, which is from a small pie, which is taking money away from the rest of the family. So, what if the child does not become happy? There are going to be three in, in three operations in the next 10-15 years, and there is no guarantee that the hospital operation is going to be successful. So, these are things that they look for. And another thing that is common is the decision making is not often by the parents, but by somebody. Uh, the grandfather or a grand uncle so i wanted to get the operation done but my in-laws were not ready so these are patients words themselves uh, often uh, of course they would not they weren't all be telling the truth because we looked at the uh, the the social workers make their own records so the so this is the social workers record they said that patient's father counseled about treatment costs patient was a genuine case for help but father took dama despite being offered full support this is the social worker writing their notes and what the pa- parent told us the patient said that no help was provided from pro which is in contradiction to the records so this is totally different so the survey would tell us so they would be actually lying in in other words uh, because and this is another one patient's long term prognosis is guarded this is the medical uh, the social workers notes patient's relatives had no willingness for further treatment they were not ready to do anything for further treatment so this is from the social workers uh, point of perspective that the, they ne- they required to make notes so this is their notes the parents said they were dissatisfaction of the patient with the behavior of the pro personnel so they were blaming the same people who took the interview so this is the, in a way that they want to so if i'm taking my child away from the hospital i am looking at i want the child to survive but i know that i can't afford it for whatever reasons and it is going to take time away from the rest of the family so i am trying to shift the blame from me on to somebody else uh, so again bringing back the same chart so there are these common three reasons 
and so our end of life decisions being taken under the cover of dama so often times uh, but not in a hospital and depending upon various hospitals if the patient's prognosis is poor uh, and if there is no guarantee for treatment uh, it is the most easiest thing to do is to counsel the parent that uh, maybe he is not going to survive or he is not going to live a, lead a meaningful life uh, you might want to consider taking the baby away uh and because the patient pays the bills and the parents pay the bill and the hospital or the insurance sector is not paying any of the bills the patient's parents can decide that i take i can i will take my baby away so it takes away the need for any kind of clinical ethics committees so you don't have to make a decision uh, to whether to so this is kind of uh, not a very good way because and even if it, there were clinical ethics committees uh, it would require at least a few people to get together uh, and uh, overall the number of amount of resources that are available in any place are very limited like our institute has around 150 students intake per year but the total amount of faculty would be around maybe 100 120 so this faculty includes the one giving clinical care as well as doing teaching like in a typical american hospital for a students intake of around 200 i think would have around 1000 faculty and all of them would have distributed kind of responses and so the number of people available to do any work is always going to be going to be less so baby and that's one way uh, that that it happens so there are rules available there are ethical guidelines uh, but uh, they are often not followed uh, the medical council of india the thing which looks after ethics in india uh, has specifically mentioned that a team of doctors uh, can make a thing about withdrawal of support and it would require at least three people to get together and decide uh, and this does not happen there are guidelines by indian critical uh, care society for medicine Uh, which also has similar guidelines there's an organ transplantation act which also has similar guidelines uh, but these are more specific to organ transplantation etc etc and they are often not uh, not followed or, or utilized because one of the easiest way is actually dama and this ap- applies not only to, uh, my study is related to kids and neonates but it can apply to even uh, adults it, it wouldn't change a quick question on that that says even after death devices sustain cardiopulmonary function even after death is that about brain death or yeah it's it's about brain death so uh, this thing talks about so this is uh, even after that if you have to st- so this is in related to the organ transplantation act mainly okay. and so the there are uh, th- there is a lot of uh, legal stuff which is there related to withdrawal of support but it's not very clear and nobody really wants to take a chance of being the first on into the court case and being decided like why did you pull the wires away Uh, there would still be there would be occasionally people who do it but it's not common place to do it best and the easiest way is to probably get the parents to say that we don't want to continue treatment and, and that's that's the most common way that that it is done uh that brings to me my next set of slides i think i got 15 minutes more and so this is something which is very local and which has happened in our place uh, what is called as uh, code krishna uh this is something which happens after death uh, of of a person and it extends throughout the institution and not only for uh, kids or children uh just a disclaimer that i don't believe in an existence of a supreme being that can one can pray to and solve our problems so you should take it in that context <laughs> okay uh this is from a team of four people uh, dr valendra vaishnav and dr smruti vaishnav uh, mr sandeep desai is our ceo of our hospital and myself so this bodily appearance is not all the form deceives the person is a mask hid deep in when celestial powers can dwell it fragile ship conveys through the seas of years and incognito of the imperishable sri orbindo is a holy figure uh, he was from west bengal he settled down in pondicherry uh, so the belief is that there is one supreme being and uh, we are not and we are all part of the supreme being so it hid deep in man celestial powers can dwell so that's the kind of focus so everyone is divine and everyone can be divine and uh, that that's how things are so and we are the body that we have is just a covering for our soul which is part of the divine so this is how so this thing is to be looked at in this context so uh, my body is just a covering uh, of a divine soul which will merge uh, with with the divine which is there everywhere so that's how that's how uh, this is phrased uh in general uh, in medical uh, situations death is generally uh, viewed as an event which signals defeat of all attempts to prolong life especially people who are in intensive care 
feel that then when a patient dies that whatever you tried for so many days or so many hours and a lot of work goes on a lot of stress and it's like you, you feel defeated uh, but that may not be for the family and they all they don't look at it in the same way they would look at uh, as, as somebody being attached to them somebody in their life uh, passing away and they are entering entering a period of grief so and when a death occurs the treating family enters into the grieving period while the treating physicians have a sense of defeat and a sense of loss of purpose which which affects them and most conventional uh, patient care fails to take uh, care uh, consideration of this uh, dimension and it's important that we need to have systemic training and sensitization of the doctors uh, and the nurses to make this an integral part uh, of the healthcare that we provide so that's the idea behind behind devising something like this so what happens uh, it's a creation of a silent and a solemn ambience um, amidst an action packed environment of critical care unit at the moments of patient death by offering a collective prayer a floral tribute and observing silence by the healthcare team together with the family members so it kind of improves the way in which the bereavement begins or the grieving process begins uh, for the relatives it also kinds of uh, closes uh, things for the healthcare team and prevents them getting traumatized by the death of somebody they have been treating for so long so why is it named code krishna so code conveys a sense of urgency and assiduousness or responsibility something that needs to be done and you cannot avoid it so when you say code red or when you say code blue everyone gets needs to get together and do it so when you say when you say code krishna uh, it gives you that urgency that we need to do it uh, so and krishna is of course i showed you on the maps initially our hospital is named sri krishna hospital and that's why it's krishna so this is a statue of krishna that is there uh, that's at the front of our hospital uh, it's actually not so well well it's a picture taken so you can see it but there are so many trees around it uh, like in san francisco park where all the trees hide all the statues even here the statue almost you can almost miss the statue uh, so it has two components basically uh, a visible or an explicit component Uh, where there is assemblage by the treating team uh, by the bedside of the expired patient the floral tribute by the team along with the family members and observing a few minutes of silence after reciting a prayer so this is what you can see what happens uh, within that environment is you are you end up expressing respect for the deceased person uh, you kind of become one with the buried family so you uh, often times they can be uh, discord between the family and the treating physician if a patient died but if you start setting this up there can be kind of closing or you merge with the family creating a silent space amidst a busy environment of wards and patient care area so icu is usually a busy environment you could uh, like our icus would be 12 based 12 treatment based we have 3 4 icus so each of them would be 12 treatment based so suddenly one treatment bay becomes kind of silent so this is what usually happens so it's basically we wanted to institutionalize the practice uh, to sensitize and empower the treating team to address the grief of the relatives of the deceased patients so we it's intended as much to the uh, to the relatives of the of, of uh, as well as the doctors and respect the departed in consonance with the cultural religious and spiritual beliefs of the family so as to fulfill the spiritual tenor of the care so it's not only specifically uh, code krishna or related to hinduism it's whatever the person's religion is uh, that that will be kind of addressed uh, it's an attempt to blend current care practices the with spirituality in a tangible process and ensure that the first commiserations to the grieving family are offered by the treating team with warm and openness so uh, it is a way to be seen as to be though you were trying to make sure that the person lives but if the person is dead or, or has died then you you be the first to uh, for your commiserations uh, so in that we you kind of help improve the grieving process for the family as well as for your own own team so what's the significance uh, it enhances sensitization of healthcare professional in that it tells us that death is a natural inevitable occurrence it sensitizes the tra treating team to address grief expresses empathy and loving care to the bereaved family uh, and care of the dying has important implications in counseling also because there are multi various faiths that are there it brings awareness about various religious spiritual convictions amongst the treating team incorporates a code of practice which respects the same and extends homage to the departed in consonance with the cultural religious and spiritual beliefs 
so there are people that when a person feel is is dead and various uh, beliefs have different belief systems for what happens to a person after he is dead so he tries to evolve that kind of for that particular family so uh, you need to have an idea of what various faiths believe in also uh, it, and so these are the various care returners that are, that are recognized it enhances physical comfort uh, while talking to the family uh, it provides emotional support by being there uh, uh, spiritual care tenor can be considered by providing access to spiritual support or um, to the to the patients uh, culturally and spiritually appropriate so culture and so depending upon what the faith is your uh, things that are there at the bedside would change so it's an appropriate milieu for for the aggrieved family and it also symbolizes the commitment of the institution so now the four people that i mentioned uh, in the initial as the people who need get credited to was the ceo so the ceo is part of the process which uh, kind of institutionalized so it already has a buy in from the uh, higher management of the institution so what it, we achieve that it, again uh, we feel that it, and our experience has been not only that what we believe that it recognizes respects and supports uh, the human feelings uh, it has it has already set into practice a paradigm which respects the collab collaborative wisdom of care based upon scientific, social, spiritual, and cultural understanding about the process of death. And we try in our own ways to gap bridge the gap between materialistic and non-materialistic dimensions of care. India as a whole and for many centuries has been less materialistic, so a lot of people would become what are called as yogis or uh, they would just kind of give up everything and. Uh, do, go to go to the go to the jungles or go to the mountains. So uh, that has always been there, and so it, this is some way tries to bring that uh, in. So very important is the last line. It ensures a semblance of care to the departed soul for the believers. So even for the people who don't believe, uh, it's still the same. We try and bring that process to everyone. So how did we go about it? It was conceptually initiated by a group of validating doctors under the guidance of a CEO. We carried out various training sessions. So this was not that we just started off. We devised what is Port Krishna. Uh, then we got all our and we have residents, nurses. So we had various training sessions for nurses, doctors, and all other staff members as to what Port Krishna is, how it will happen. It was done in a, in a process way. And then after that, we began practicing Port Krishna. So uh, it was kind of a program which we planned. Uh, trained everyone and then now we are executing so we have a, a very clear cut uh, process so the step one is declaration of death and explaining patients relatives about court krishna practice information given to the healthcare team for the availability so one explaining the patient's care relatives then so there might be one or two residents at the patient's bedside or one treating physician there would be other team members that may not be available there so if if an oncology patient has died in a surgical ICU, the surgeon might be there, but the oncologist may not be there. So the information to the oncologist on other related related healthcare is also given. That's when so person has died. So they would come there. Preparation of the deceased soul, soul and veneration train is done prior to the event. So assemblage is made to perform last office rituals. Then there's also a official letter of condolence signed by the in charge or any member of the team. Usually usually the primary care treating care physician signs that letter. And after that, a phone call is made by any member of the team after two weeks to overcome grief, empathy, and extending help in a matter of certificate. So right from announcing death, announcing death to the rest of the team members, asking whether we can do Code Krishna, uh, doing, doing the process, signing a letter of condolence, and doing a follow-up call two weeks later. So it's not just one event that happens at the bedside. Uh, there's something that follows up, follows up after, after it also. Uh, so there's a checklist, like all checklists that have been used everywhere. So again, uh, whether this has happened, so whatever I said earlier, so relatives explained consent taken for the same. So we don't do it without consent. Ensure presence of healthcare team, uh, fulfillment of the spiritual and religious needs of the patient, as well as the relatives to the extent possible. So they might want a song played uh, of people. They might want to bring someone from outside, a priest from outside. They might want to do it, uh, and so on and so forth. So whatever they want uh, is done. Uh, maintain dignity and respect of the deceased body as per the hospital policy. Uh, we have what is called as a humane care uh, chairman. So uh, as I head the uh, research group, uh, I'm a chairman of the research group. We have what are called as uh, humane care. Uh, then there is uh, evidence-based care. So there are various groups. And one of them is a humane care group. And Dr. Vaishnav is chairman of the human care. And check whether the letter of condolence is being given. So 
this uh, this is the treating uh, treating physician and other support staff so this is nurses so this is uh, krishna and this is uh, uh, one of the books this is another saint flowers so physician leads it usually but it is not binding so if the physician does not want to lead it it's okay but somebody else who leads it so what people have said the practice provides the much needed human touch in the era of high tech medicine and solace it offers is very deeply touching it's far exceeding except expect, uh, expectations in the most crucial moments of hospitalization very rare to be found anywhere it was beyond the, her wildest imagination that the treating team will stand with them in silence and recite a prayer solemnly observing the moment of death inside the critical care unit i was deeply moved by the spontaneity with which the team quickly gathered and the care of the dead has to be like this always so there's relative feedback so this is a signal i would not read entirely but uh, it talks about uh, how, how the entire thing happened it mentions names of various doctors so the practice uh, this practice fills a heart with gratitude eyes with tears Okay, so this is this is in Gujarati. So this is written in Gujarati. So what do the nurses feel? Nurses feel that the practice brings stillness in the environment, which brings peace. The silence is so unique. The residents have been active participants and hopefully will carry the practice forward in the various places that they will go to later on. So how is it different? It does not rely on influences that are external to the hospital environment. So what happens in in many hospitals? If you could get a priest coming from outside. so if and it depends upon the relatives whether they can bring a priest in or not and they may not be affording them they not have the connections but even if somebody ca- can't do it if the treating team does it that will kind of help them in in many ways uh so it attempts to pr- uh, provide components of spiritual tenor and in many ways even if physicians themselves may not be a believing kind they might end up becoming a little bit spiritual because of this process so i may not be a person who believes in god but due to this process over a period of time i might not believe in what but at least i'll kind of understand what other people feel so it kind of trains people who are not believers into how believers how you should behave with believers so it, it, that's that's important and that training is not that a part of any curriculum so this is kind of a curriculum for for the non believers uh it provides an opportunity and responsibility for providing healing care and emotional support to the medical team so as i said traditionally it has been entrusted to spiritual caregivers uh, such as chaplains and nursing staff and to traditional healers for deaths taking place in the community so when deaths happen in the hospital these people are kind of cut out so we are trying to kind of get that idea into the hospital so why uh it fulfills the responsibility to provide support and care appropriate to the emotional fabric of grieving families it brings about synthesis of material and non material dimensions of care within the framework of a modern hospital so in a word it's that's what we owe to our patients our students and truly to ourselves so what are the challenges face uh, as i said we are under resourced mostly and so uh, nurses uh, even in the icus don't have we don't have the same uh, probably what the best is the number of nurses so it requires multitasking for nurses uh, engagement of the healthcare team with core functions we are trying to get it to do something else there might be hesitance or unwillingness of some of the relatives so they are not exactly sure uh, so many of them would not be religious or may be religious but may not think that this is done in a prop- appropriate way so there might be hesitation on that part there can be an availability of flowers practical stuff if death occurs during night time everyone may not be there so something happens at 2 am in the night you may not get all the treating team over there and uh, so they might and if at that point of time when the death occurs if there are some other serious patient in the icu uh, you obviously cannot get everyone there because the other patients need care at the same time so this is something which will happen on ongoing basis and which will always be there and i don't think we can take care of these challenges and these are going to be there so we should be aware that these things are going to be there and maybe work out in, in whatever way we can so spiritual tenor of care is ingrained in all human beings and this kind of allows us to get it out of whoever is involved uh, it's an institutional protocol based on principles of integral health and it can fulfill obligations of the medical profession in serving non materialistic yet tangible 
deeply rooted needs of the society in end of life situation so this is what we don't usually look at um, but this is something which this practice kind of uh, allows us to have and also very imp important for healthcare professionals to overcome their own suppressed grief reflect on, me on meaning of life and prevent desensitization to death events so we need to get sensitized to death events uh, and at the same time if we are very overly sensitized uh, maybe we, uh, we we can we may not get too damaged by a lot of deaths that are happening in the icu uh, i i know that if a lot of deaths happen in icus uh, the nurses and the doctors do f have a lot of burnout uh, and this is one way in which it can probably be taken care of these are various references and thank you very much thank you I uh, didn't think you could do it in 35 minutes. But you I'm did. fast. <laughs> um, so many questions. Let me remind people online, if you have a question or a comment, type it in that little chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We can read those out here in the uh, studio. Um, let me start with one uh, about Dhamma. Uh, you gave all the reasons why parents mm -hmm. wanted to leave, but it, is it always the case that it is against medical advice, or are there sometimes situations where uh, the doctors are actually recommending that the patient go home, and Dhamma is just the legal means to accomplish that? Uh, yes. Uh, so it 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 is uh, it is not always that the patient wants to go on their own. Uh, so it is often also that, and we don't know. I don't know the exact percentages, but if it is it is likely that the patient is not going to do well. Uh, and we know that the patient is not going to survive, often the doctor would tell them that we, we know that the patient is not going to uh, live or patient is going to have a very bad life in the future. They would not tell them to take the patient away straight away, but they would tell them that this is what is going to happen. Because the patient is paying and it is not related to insurance, if the patient stays and the patient pays, the hospital will earn definitely. So it is not in the hospital's best interest to say that you take the patient home dama. So it is generally, so this is in a private setups where it is not in the hospital's best interest. Now you change the situation to a public hospital where uh, the patient is there and the situation is the same. Now in the public health scenario, it's going to be different. I have maybe 20, 30 beds. All of them are full. I have 10 ventilators. All of them are full. And if this patient is occupying a ventilator, which is not uh, which is which is to me is, is useless because the patient is not going to survive or is going to lead a bad life. That patient taking that that relative taking that patient away allows me to use that ventilator to someone uh, who might require it more and who might survive. So there are so depending upon which sector you are in, it differs. If I know that the patient cannot afford, uh, then I, I can tell them that this is in this fashion, and you can decide what you want to do. In public sector, it is it is it has been said, especially the uh, emergency uh, paper that I mentioned. Uh, it talks about how residents might chase the patients away because they don't want an additional responsibility in the hospital. So it it can and does happen, but I'm sure nobody's going to talk about it. And if a patient is on a ventil, if a baby is on a ventilator and you discharge them and stop the ventilator, many of them will not make it home. Right? They will die. They would die on the way mostly, or, or they would go home and die. And we have had incidences where uh, we have said that you shouldn't take the patient home. Uh, like there have been 1.1 kg newborn preterm baby, very likely to survive with routine care. But uh, because parents, for whatever reason, decided to take them home, and generally in our setup, we would say like, please don't take home, stay here. And they would, and if, they, if you take the patient home, you'll die. Uh, they have taken them home away. But our residents have kind of phoned them recently, and what has happened? So like some babies have survived. And they said, you told us that baby will die, but baby has not died, so you are wrong. Mm. So that, in a way, it has been good, but I fear that if a patient goes home and does not receive proper care, uh, uh, he might survive, but he might end up with more uh, poorer neurological outcome than would have, would have happened in the hospital. Right. So that's one thing. So they may not die, but uh, that's my worst fear. If the patient dies, it's still at least the patient is dead, but if the patient has survived, uh, they might often survive with neurological deficits, which they may not have had in the hospital. Yeah. So, which which is bad. Uh, and one quick question about the code Krishna. All the pictures you showed were adults. 
Yeah, all the pictures that showed were adults. Uh, this is used in children. No, this is in children as well. as well. Yeah. So before Court Krishna came in, uh, uh, this was I think about seven eight years ago. Uh, we have done this when patients have requested, not as a hospital policy, but when patients have requested, we have had them come uh, and uh, sang their religious songs. Uh, got a priest inside. I trained in Goa, so Goa has a lot of Catholic population. So even there, I've had uh, people getting baptized in the NICU and then dying. So it does happen. If the relatives request it, it definitely is allowed by most hospitals. But uh, this is like specifically from the hospital side we're doing it. And who offers the prayer? Is it uh, so an ICU attending? So in this one, it was the ICU attending. Uh, but it could be an uh, usually many of them uh, would know their prayers. Most yeah. of them would know their prayers. And so it's usually the nurses or the ICU attending that, okay. that do it. Brian, and remember, people online, if you have questions, type them in. We'll start to read those out in a minute. Dr. Nimbakar, that was a moving presentation. And, and for some people, it might even be provocative. Um, I have a couple of observations, and I would uh, value your input as to whether I'm thinking along the right lines or not. First, it appears that this is um, emanating from a very communitarian orientation in India. That is, the care and concern of the family and the community prevails sometimes at the expense of the individual. And I'd like you to elaborate on that, if that in fact is true. And secondly, um, with the Code Krishna, what you present is an absolutely uh, parallel, if not the same model, of palliative care integration in Western medicine. But, it, but how you present it suggests that one need not have a palliative care service. And I would appreciate your comments on those. Yeah, uh, coming to the first one, uh, the community perspective. Now, I think that's uh, typically Indian as compared to the American perspective. And American uh, individual perspective is much more valued and individual stands foremost. Uh, while in India, it's uh, not only uh, that it has been is usually a shared uh, kind of, uh, what do you say, uh, approach of everything and uh, so that's one and I don't think it's ne unnecessarily only because it's a community perspective most of the decisions that get taken care of care, take care because of uh, resources being uh, finite and uh, in that uh, person who's dying or dead or may not be productive in the future life uh, it, it that 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 might be the reason why it happens uh, I actually trained in Goa which is slightly different from Gujarat and when I came to Gujarat, I was quite shocked about the words like guarantee. Uh, so this is quite common. And about uh, being, why invest? So these are, and so this is my perspective in this area. Uh, it may not be the same throughout India. So uh, in different places, it might be different. But the community perspective is definitely there. Uh, but they are very, they are very nice. If people will, you tell them that this child will survive then people will go at extra lengths to get money, arrange money. So that also is there. It's not that, that uh, it, it's just that we, we will not do it. They will also look at it in that, from the individual's perspective, saying that uh, if that person is not going to have a good life ever, uh, what's the point of saving? And so it's probably what they are thinking rather than uh, they're thinking. And because they pay the bills and they decide, uh, they would definitely prevail over the healthcare system. Healthcare system. I had a different experience about 10 years back, and I would like to explain this. Uh, we, have, we were treating a child called as, uh, say, A. Uh, he was a GB syndrome, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, and he was, at, he was, I think, four or five years old, got admitted. Uh, and then about seven, eight days, he was on a ventilator. About seven, eight days later, he decompensated because of bleed into the, into the lungs, developed plastic bronchitis. Uh, and because his uh, became difficult to ventilate, it was decided to uh, uh, do bronchoscopy and remove the uh, uh, the stuff in in, in the area uh, in the airways. Now, while we were uh, while he was underwent bronchoscopy and we were picking out uh, clots from from his airway, he arrested. And so we did CPR in the op operating room where the endoscopy was being done. And we did CPR for some five minutes, 10 minutes, and the patient still did not revive. So I went out and talked to the parents and saying that, see, it's almost 10 minutes since we have done. Uh, it's been bad, and I don't think it'll survive. And we think that we should stop, because if he survives even after 10 minutes of uh, a flat line and poor saturation, we believe that he may be neurologically uh, disabled and he may not do well. 
but the parents insisted that we don't and they were affording in some terms of resources we don't care what it takes to get him back if you get him back uh, we want him back so you and we don't care if you take two hours to resuscitate and if he becomes alive and then end of it we would want him so we went back and we continue, the resuscitation continued a patient came out uh, he and he remained in uh, bad shock for a couple of days remained on the ventilator survived stayed for a total of 6 months in the hospital was discharged on a wheelchair and was uh, poor, very poor neurologically uh, so actually in between i left i had i had gone away and when i came back two years later the ch- child came on a wheelchair he was not that he was still neurologically bad definitely but he still could recognize his parents which was good enough for the parents apparently five years down the line he immigrated to us is currently in cancer uh, not cancer is in new york and he goes to a school still neurological disabled but he goes to a normal school so you have and so the, that's the point i was trying to make it's more about resources and uh, rather than about uh, community and because the resources are shared by the community it comes from a community view point uh, regarding the code krishna again it's uh, similar to palliative care uh, but uh, dissimilar in the sense that we really don't have any palliative care in india most hospitals in india don't have any palliative care our institute has started palliative care for in the last 2 years uh, the people offering palliative care in our institute are different from the people who did the code krishna so in that way they are not that's not the same idea but they it's come independently of of each other and uh, this is more easier uh, palliative care would require training and so on and so forth and it, it's more easy to do in terms of uh, it's more scalable so uh, we believe that if code krishna is utilized by other hospitals in the country it's quite easy to do without being uh, very uh, prescriptive in, in in nature we have some online questions and we'll get to sarosh yes the the uh, online community has been stirred by your talk and many questions are coming in several of which concern uh the process of getting consent or or respecting various kinds of preferences that families might have around um, the service. Um, so let me start with just if you, asking if you can say a little bit more about the consent process or, or how the families are approached about this. Is there a written or verbal uh, consent that's that's re- uh, requested of the families for having uh, code yeah, the, the code yeah. Krishna called? Uh, so the code Krishna consent is taken by talking to the relatives who are there. and it's it's more of a verbal consent initially because then because it's going to be we're going to ask them what they want so so in one of the pictures you saw sai baba's picture so they they will decide what to get and if they decide not to do it if they don't consent they are not going to be there so there's no point in doing that doing it if they are not there the family needs to be there for the process to occur it, it's not just for the doctors so it's not like so if the family is not going to be part of it uh it, it's not going to matter so obviously the consent is going to be integral part of uh, of doing it we can't do it without consent and it is more important because they can bring their own ideas to it what what songs they want to be uh, what kind of prayer they want uh, what kind of flowers they want what kind of pictures they want what book they want because uh, even within our community there will be different sects having different behaviors or different ideas about things so they need to bring that to the table and without consent obviously that's not going to be possible that that gets into the next question which i think is we could put at the largest level about religious diversity and so what if you had a family you know muslim family um or or someone who wouldn't want <laughs> yeah so we had a muslim i showed a picture of a muslim uh-huh. family so there was a muslim family and so you could get, you could definitely get uh if somebody wants to say the prayer there they could sing it or you could get somebody from outside to do it so that's not a problem so we have had hindu muslim and catholic so far Mm-hmm. so these three are the main regions which, which are there and among hindus and muslims so if they have different sects they have their own so that's not a problem swaraj predictions about like as you said some kids even survive 
uh, when the parents take them home. You think the and and we also don't want to be too hopeful when we are counseling the parents, and we don't want to be want them to lose hope as well. You think the way we counsel the parents also affects uh, their decision in making this uh, leaving again the. Dama. Yeah, so for Dama, the way we counsel is very important and depends upon. Oh, so it's it's obviously very important. It's it's very difficult to uh, get to uh, what you want to do, and it's it's very important the way we counsel. So if and depend even upon the various attendings or the consultants who do it, uh, I I always always have a non futilistic approach. So I always believe that anybody who survives should survive. anyone if it is with a poor brain function i think still should survive it's my way of looking at it because we we don't know what the person is feeling and but another person in my same unit may not feel the same so it differs even with among consultants it's going to definitely be differing among among residents but in general uh, you can have a very clear cut uh, we don't have really very uh, difficult scenarios uh, anybody roughly more than 800 or 900 in a nicu 800 900 grams is expected to survive so those patients will never get counseled that they are going to be bad so that is out of question so somebody less than 700 grams in our in our unit wouldn't survive so you tell them survival chances in our unit uh, for brain damage we al- always almost suggest for birth asphyxia that we should do a mri scan that will tell us and mri is very good at good at prognosticating brain damage in the future Forget, not about survival but about at least brain damage in the future and ventilation parameters related to healthcare will tell you about what might happen to the lungs so we may not be very good prognosticators but you, you can definitely uh, depends upon the unit policy you should should err on the policy of better survival rather than poorer survival but given the fact in, in public sector enterprises where that would add to your burden you might decide to prognosticate in a different way it's always going to be a double edged sword so uh, going going back to the religious diversity kind of angle here you you made it clear that you're trying to accommodate the particular beliefs of the patient and family um what about the healthcare workers someone's asking is that a so when you seek the availability of people for a code krishna do, does that come into play is there like a statement of which perspective <laughs> which religious tradition will be Uh, yeah so the prayer prayer. And, and i'm thinking from you know i i i know some people who would feel very uncomfortable going to a distinctly different religious tradition so i'm wondering yeah. if that's ever an issue of conflict or so uh, that's something very important that you said and actually coming from india uh, it makes it different because the dominant religion 80 85% is actually hinduism and as a religion it's very enco- very very what do you say accommodating so a hindu will go to a church will go to a mosque will go to anywhere you ask him to go and he'll come back because that's he believes that there's a soul and there's a single so so because the majority people are like that it's not going to be a problem uh, uh, and if somebody wants to excuse himself or herself the healthcare provider from the situation it's it's all right you can just decide not to be there uh, so you can always say you're busy doing something else <laughs> and that's not going to be a problem right uh, a- another question uh, dr nimbukar uh really based on the exceptional case that you gave uh with regard to the child who survived an oxic brain injury and relocated to New York and and is living a life um that is a value to both he and his parents it also seems that in India as other places around the world if there's not been a sense of normalcy for accommodating the disabled then envisioning care for that individual is perhaps seemingly impossible and that would factor into decisions against uh, medical advice but it would also um likely influence practitioners and what the clinicians counsel so in many ways you've represented this as a resource issue is it more than that in other words is the ethical tension that we in north america may feel about this solely predicated on the fact that we have resources that would and laws that would accommodate those with varied abilities yeah so that's a good point that you make uh the normalcy of anything depends upon what you see around you and it's also reflected in the fact and i can give a different example related to weights uh 
generally children would be of low weight but people would feel it is normal because that's what you see everywhere and if i tell that parent that this child's weight is not good they will feel no is good weight uh, so it's coming to the same question when you put it in this perspective of uh, resources being available for for this decision making uh, I, i think because um, many of the people who are handicapped wouldn't get that many kind of avenues to uh, move around or to get jobs uh, this perspective would be there uh, on the providers way of counseling so that might come into play but as i said because the decisions are made mainly by the family members it, it's their perspective which counts more than the healthcare provi- providers and their perspective is not go- perspective is not going to be different from that of the healthcare providers they will feel that if my child is going to become handicapped etc uh, he may not live a good life and that is because what that is what they see around them the perspective definitely matters time for one more quick one Uh yeah uh so can you clarify you mentioned an organ donation act and someone I think wants you to just kind of clarify how this would all of this would uh balance against potential organ donation could you say more about that yeah the organ donation act comes into play because uh routine acts do not talk about end of life scenarios that is one act which is requires to talk about end of life scenarios so that's why i brought into brought it into the presentation so that's very clear the organ donation act uh, for cat and people are trying to get cadaveric donation up uh, more into into limelight and there have been quite a few successful organ donation that have been done recently there have, there's actually even a movie made on one organ donation where i think people moved a heart or a kidney at a heart i think from chennai to bangalore in in a two hour period or something like that so the reason is beca- because the laws are around that are very clear but they still don't apply to general end of life uh, questions so we need to uh, stop thank you so much for coming all the way from gujarat to speak to our group here in kansas city uh, we are eager to develop collaborations with people around the globe we've had many students from india so if some of you are watching and would like to participate in our online pediatric bioethics certificate program go to our website www.cmh.edu/cmbc or just put children's mercy bioethics center into your search engine and you can find out more about that thank you so much thank you very much thanks a lot